we have no choice but to embrace complexity. And that's a plea, a request, an ask, call it what you want that I have. Please embrace complexity. You know, so many times as, as an advisor and analyst, I get people complaining about, oh, well, these SDGs are so complicated. And I say, please, please, they have to be. Now is the time to turn rage into action. Every fraction of the degree matters. Every voice can make a difference. And every second counts. I wanted to panic. I wanted to act as if the house was on fire, because it is. From the pandemic to climate change, going it alone is simply not an option. For those who have eyes to see, for those who have ears to listen, and for those who have a heart to feel, 1.5 is what we need to survive. Welcome back to the Accelerating Climate Solutions podcast. I'm Stefan Schurig from the Foundation's platform F20. And I'm Ruth Richardson from the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. This podcast is about uncovering the hard topics at the heart of the climate crisis debate and getting to the bottom of what's holding back solutions. The Global Alliance for the Future of Food and the Foundation's platform F20 are networks of philanthropic organizations that work to create a more sustainable and inclusive future. This week, we're diving into a topic that I'm really passionate about. We're looking at the true cost of food systems on our climate. Stefan, I want to start by painting a picture for you. Imagine yourself at the supermarket. Maybe you're in the produce section eyeing up a carton of strawberries. The price tag for that fruit is focused on financial profit, profit for the supermarket, profit for the fruit wholesalers. But what that price tag doesn't necessarily consider are the other costs that went into that juicy strawberry. That includes costs that are more difficult to attach a price tag to, like the working conditions of the person who picked that fruit, or the health and environmental costs of the pesticides that were used to grow it. All too often, these social environmental impacts created by food systems go unaccounted for in the final price of food. True cost accounting is about making these tricky, more difficult to quantify costs visible. In this episode, we're talking about how you can apply true cost accounting approach in your work and how doing so will benefit the climate agenda. In the guest seat this week are two brilliant minds. First, we have Pavan Tsukdev, former president of World Wildlife Fund International and founder and CEO of Just Impact. Welcome, Pavan. Hi, Ruth. Delighted to be with you guys today. Fantastic. We're also joined by Sarah Farley, vice president for the Rockefeller Foundation's food team. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me. Before we enter into this discussion, we ask our guests always the same question. And uh, we're going to start here first with Pavan. Maybe you can uh, start with this. The question we would like to have is, if you, if you could press one button or if you could press a button and change one thing on the climate crisis, what would it actually be? That's actually a pretty tough, tough question. But, you know, I think I know what I would do, uh, recognizing that three-fourths of the economy measured in GVA, gross value added, or measured in jobs, 75% of the economy in the U.S. is basically a corporate economy, and globally the answer is about two-thirds on average. I would press the button which says it's mandatory for every corporation on the planet that's of any size to actually publish their true cost accounting results, in other words, publish their impacts on the environment and on society in addition to their impacts on shareholders. That's what I do. I hope we will find that button actually quite soon. Um, Sarah, how about you? If you could change one thing, what would it be? Well, first, I love Pavan's answer. And I think Pavan's answer, we know if we could do that today, we would be pretty horrified yeah, with yeah. what that button would <laughs> reveal. Right. My answer gets to the real fundamental shifts that I think we need for which if they were to be executed, if you press Pavan's button, you'd see a really different picture. So my button, the button I want to push would really shift the balance of power within the food system. What does that mean? It means less corporate consolidation. It means more thriving, small and medium-sized farms. It means 
greater voice and influence of farms, farm workers, food producers, indigenous communities, local communities, those experiencing the greatest hardships of the many intersecting challenges in climate, environment, nature, health, and food. You know, we saw in our true cost accounting report in the United States, where we looked at 14 different metrics of food, uh, the biggest ones, the biggest unaccounted cost of those strawberries that Ruth was speaking to, they're the negative impacts on human health, working conditions, depletion of natural resources, worsening climate change and biodiversity loss. And every one of those impacted areas hits hardest communities of color. They're the ones bearing the disproportionate burden of those costs. So then what we see is that those that are really the backbone of our food system in the United States, whether they're farm workers or farmers, fishers, ranchers, et cetera, they're the ones most negatively impacted. They're bearing the highest unaccounted costs. And I'll give you the example of diabetes. So, you know, one of the most striking diet related diseases, if you're Latinx in America, you're 1.7 times more likely to have diabetes or be diagnosed than a white individual, 1.5 times more likely if you're a Black American. So in a world with equity and a redistribution of power within the food system, these costs would dissipate. And that's why I think that let's use Pavan's button for a before and after contrast and my button of the redistribution of power. We live in a very, very different world. Wow, well, yeah. both of you guys aim very high. <laughs> Fantastic. These are big buttons. Big yeah, buttons. these are big buttons. And I'm, and I'm really yeah. pleased because actually what they both say to me is that we really need to shift the governance of food systems, which I'm thrilled to hear because the Global Alliance has seven calls to action that are sort of imperatives for food systems transformation. And governance happens to be number one. And I think this idea of power imbalances, of really attending to the most marginalized, and of really looking at corporate accountability, all speak to that, that very, very critical piece on governance. But let's just back up for a second. Food and agriculture systems have positive and negative impacts on health and well-being of people, animals, and the planet. And calculating these tolls and factoring them into the cost of food is vital to make progress towards sustainable development goals. We've talked about this a lot, all of us. Um, so I know we're all on the same page, but for our listeners, you know, increasing awareness about the true cost of food has been a priority for the Global Alliance and certainly has been a priority for you, Pavan, and you, Sarah, at the Rockefeller Foundation. Pavan, in 2018, we collaborated with you and the UN on something called TEAB Agri-Food Framework. Yeah. This was a huge, huge step in creating a universal approach that considers the kind of the full complexity of food and agriculture systems. So Pavan, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about true cost accounting as a tool. Why is it useful to put a price tag on the positive and negative environmental, social health and economic costs of food systems? True cost accounting is actually a whole value chain of actions. Perhaps the first value chain is to recognize that using a single yardstick like per hectare productivity of a single crop is actually a very weak metric to measure something that is so complex as food systems. It's about human health. It's about the largest employment source on the planet, bar none. It's, it's about respecting nature around us and ensuring that we grow food in a way that doesn't destroy ecosystems such as the rainforests of Indonesia or, or Brazil, or such as the wetlands of the Pantanal, but rather reinforces their survival in order to have a healthy planet. And it's about so many other things. It's about culture. It's about equations between people, co commensality and, and con connubiality, as they say, are some of the defining features of societies, eating together, and so on and so on. So there's a lot in food systems. And to just say that you somehow put a single yardstick, as in just how many quintals of rice grow on this hectare of, of land, that's clearly inadequate. So... The framework of true cost accounting has to be three things. It has to be comprehensive, it has to be universal, and it has to be inclusive. Comprehensive means when we look at the climate impacts of food or the social impacts of food or the human health impacts of food systems, we've got to account for all of those. That's about accounting for externalities, big externalities, which are being completely left out of the lens of social and policy analysis. We need to bring it back into that lens of policy analysis. 
then there's this whole issue of being universal. If we can't have horses for courses, you, you can't have me following one approach because I've got a, uh, let's say, natural farming lens and you following another approach because you've got a social equity lens and Sarah following a third approach because she's got an environmental impacts lens and so on. It's got to be a universal approach. So it's got to be one framework through which you can, as a lens, as a complex lens, can look at any food systems in the world and look at it from any angle, which is here's policy A versus policy B. What does it do to food? Or here's farming system A, natural farming versus farming system B, chemical farming intensive. What does that do to food systems? Or here's a sustainable product being prepared versus an unsustainable product. What does that do? Or here's a food plate. Let's call it, for the sake of argument, a fast food plate, which has beef coming through hamburgers all the way from Brazil and, and you know, rice coming from China or India or whatever. And here's a local plate. How do you compare these two in terms of their impacts? So these different lenses also have to have different angles of view, right? And that's being about universal. And finally, even though I'm an economist and I will try and apply the economic approach to this and say that, look, it's about human well-being and quantifying human well-being. Well, so there might be somebody else who says, no, it's about inclusion. It's about in ensuring that the poorest people on the planet have good, healthy food and leave, lead healthy lives and long lives, right? In, they, so, and I respect that. That's a perfectly valid approach. That is, I wish to be inclusive. I'm as an economist saying, well, I wish to ensure that public wealth is optimized, human health, social wealth, physical wealth, and material wealth, and everything else. So you need to have a system which has the flexibility of being inclusive based on what kind of approach do you want to follow. But if you're inclusive, please remember, you can't not be universal and you can't not be comprehensive. So it's got to be an and, it's not an either or. So we have to have a framework which is comprehensive, universal, and inclusive. And indeed, the framework that you referred to, Ruth, which is the TEAB for Agriculture and Food Framework, was designed by 150 different research uh, scientists, ag agronomists, agricultural economists, you know, normal economists, environmental economists like me, people who are focused on uh, particular crop systems, particular gender equity issues, particular issues on the, the social side, out of that dropped this amazing framework, which is basically, it is truly comprehensive, universal, inclusive. Once you've done that and you've used that lens, the next step is to say, okay, let's follow that lens. Let's follow that approach and use good methodology, sound science, robust economics and honesty in collecting data, 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 data. Without data, none of this is actually possible. We have to collect the data, use the methodologies which are scientific and economically and socially sound, and use, most importantly, in my opinion, the foundation of it all, which is the comprehensive, universal and inclusive framework, such as the one that, Ruth, you referred to, the team for Agriculture and Food Framework. Yeah, so Pavan, thank you for that, and very clear and concise. I think my follow-up question for you is that, you know, we've seen this in our work when we talk about tea bag or food. People go, yeah, 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 I get it, right? Comprehensive, holistic, da, 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 whatever. But what does it actually mean in my in my practical day-to-day -day life? With tea bag or food, we also pointed to a couple of key end users. We talked about businesses, we've talked about policymakers, we've talked about farmers as primary users. There are others, of course, but those would be the three primary ones. Maybe we could just focus in on the policymakers, just given our audience. What is your advice practically for how policymakers can really tangibly start integrating this? Um, because it can sometimes be up in the clouds and we've got to bring it right down to the doable, to the practical, to the tangible. Yeah, so what, what advice would you have for policymakers? Policymakers is please apply it. So find the area where you have some of the most difficult challenges of poverty and inequity. Find the areas where you have some of the most difficult challenges of productivity, as in agri-productivity. And look at the food systems that are available and see how well each is doing. And by the way, we have a project such as that, which is just gonna come out shortly, which is in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India. In the, in the east side of India, in the east coast. It's a coastal state. It's got 6 uh, million farmers out of a total population of 55 million. So it's quite a fairly heavily farming state. And we're going to apply this across four different agricultural systems. The what we call sort of intensive farming system, which is basically heavy on agrochemical pesticides and fertilizers. Another system, which is a rain fed system, which is in the central part of the state. Another system, which is basically a tribal system in the remote areas in the north of the state, and a fourth system, which is the new natural farming system. And we're actually applying this framework and comparing 
and saying, oh, well, first things that we've discovered is, oh, the yields are actually higher in the natural farming system compared to each of the others, literally over the three, over the three to five year horizon that we study. And the next thing we discover is, good heavens, the incidence of on-farm farmer ill health, in other words, uh, problems due to pesticides, kidney failures, and the likes, these are actually lower as well. And the third thing we found is that, oh, that's interesting, the costs have gone down because in three of these uh, systems, there aren't many input costs, whereas in the chemical farming one, there are. So the costs are actually lower in some systems. And then finally, we found, ah, the produce is selling better if it's a natural farming produce. So even though the price is the same, the realization to the farmer, the, the, the small farmer, is actually higher because her produce is more likely to sell completely as in 100% as, as against other farmers' produce, which comes back partly returned from the local markets. So we discover a number of things as we, as we investigate. And this is the role that, in my opinion, governments, especially provincial governments, state governments can play. They can encourage such projects to evaluate different farming systems and come to the truth of the matter, but in a holistic way. Do not apply a single lens based on your preferred you know, pet hobby, whatever it is, be it environment or, or economic productivity or, or whatever it is, or gender equity, but apply the lot and then see the results. And that's what we find. You will find also amazingly uh, powerful ways of demonstrating shortcuts. Well, the government of India, as I understand, is in fact looking at a national level uh, approach to re-examine their, their subsidies towards uh, agrochemical sector, in especially certain subsidies. So they're looking at the true cost of that subsidy and including that in their evaluation of farming. And who knows, they might redirect those subsidies into more deserving areas for society and for the farm. This is where it gets exciting. Yeah, it's, 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 all, hap it's all happening. It's all happening, Ruth. It, this is not theory. I'm describing to you what's going on out there. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, I think it really is important to also refer to cases that have proved successful, especially when discussing about global frameworks. The challenge is always where are the hard links to national, and regional, and provincial policy making and opportunities for policy making to really put this into action. It's really good to get these concrete examples and look how, how they've been doing. Sarah, I mean, there are many reasons for obvious uh, true cost accounting. One reason is that uh, we are um, faced with a climate crisis, with um, the impacts. We are um, seeing climate impacts happening all around the world at the moment. And it's um, obviously really, really needed to reduce emissions. Now, we know that the industrial food system accounts for almost a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. And because of this connection, food systems transformation is a significant opportunity to advance the climate agenda. So with so much research pointing to this link, my question is, why do you think action at the food climate intersection hasn't gained more traction? Or do you think it has, and we're just seeing the implementation now to come? Well, no, I, I do think there's there's been too little action that we are starting to see momentum. And I think there are several factors that explain why we've had a challenge getting the kind of velocity needed. You know, one is that the, the industrial agricultural system as we know it, it evolved over the past century to be highly reliant on fossil fuels, fertilizer production, global supply chains that transport goods across the world. You know, you often hear people say the food system is broken. I, I disagree. The food system isn't broken. It was designed, it is performing against the outcomes for which it was originally intended at a time when thinking about environmental consequence, justice, these, these were not the considerations. The premium was productivity. And for that, it is delivering. And so what we saw was that all those forces were then exacerbated by the Green Revolution, which we say saved millions of lives, but it imposed such high costs in terms of the environment and on culture and human and com communities. And I think indigenous people, local, regional farming systems whose practices regenerated the natural resources many of those practices were destroyed. And such practices now we recognize are desperately needed. They're needed to sequester carbon. They're needed to promote soil health, to conserve water, conserve biodiversity, and produce healthy food for, for communities, for the world. So 
today we're seeing all this innovation around the food system, but there is still this inertia because of where we've come from and the forces, the structures in place, holding in place this food system that simply is no longer fit for purpose. All that said, you know, I am, I am an optimist, maybe a, a frightened optimist given these, these great pressures. I mean, I do change will come it, and it will come from different directions. I think what we need to be thinking about is how we support indigenous people, local communities in reclaiming their food ways in today's context. I think that is absolutely essential. At the same time, we need to drive government policy and action and work to shape consumer demand. I think that's also highly crucial. And in that respect, the Rockefeller Foundation you know, we are committed to the transformation of the food system. We want to see a simultaneous, and I love the way Pavan was speaking to you, taking on the whole lot. Let's not optimize either our analysis or our interventions for one aspect. We are, and I've said it in multiple uh, arenas, we're out of time for ores. It's time to fight for ants. We need nourishing and regenerative and equitable. And, and in that way, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see where Rockefeller is going. We've made the largest investment we've ever made to those simultaneous dimensions of a food system, over $100 million to not just increase access to healthy food, but to assure that this is food that is reducing greenhouse gas emissions and promoting the equitable access of that food and participation for small and medium enterprises. So still a long way to go, but I think we're starting to see signals. In another podcast, we discussed the overall target of resilience, and especially when it comes to food and regenerative food production or to the means of regenerative food production or changing the food system. This is a huge contribution to adapting to the climate impacts because it really keeps the the soil solid, right? It really sort of um, keeps keeps um, our forest um, intact and our natural system intact, much to the difference of industrial farming. So, is that is that something that we should probably highlight? way more stronger? Absolutely. What we're talking about is nothing short of seismic shift. It's about the rewiring of the system from production through to consumption. Talking about regenerative, I, there's so, so much potential. I think there are dimensions of it for which we still need more data and evidence. I think the Global Alliance has done tremendous work making the case that when we talk about the evidence for regenerative, we're not talking about just scientific peer-reviewed literature. We're talking about a fusion of traditional indigenous knowledge, indigenous foodways, stories, lived experience, and yes, peer-reviewed science and, and data from a host of really exciting innovations, geospatial data, et cetera. So there's a lot we need to look at here, but but the evidence that we see is tremendously promising. And, and the last point I'd make is when we talk about the potential of a shift to regenerative stroke agroecological, this is not just a carbon play and it's not just a soil play. I think in my mind, when I hear this word, and I know there's a lot of, it's a charged construct, the word regenerative for, for reasons of equity and justice and, and appropriation. I, I now hear that word and I think of a spectrum and let's just put numbers to it from zero to 10, ranging from shallow regenerative to deep regenerative. I think the, the greatest potential is when we're talking about a shift of production systems to deep regeneration. And there you're, you're beyond just biophysical transformation. Yes, you're getting the carbon sequestration, the healthy soils, the biodiversity in the water, but you're also taking on those sociocultural dimensions, which the agroecological community has fought for and, and, and really struggle to gain traction around for a long, long time. Time. We're talking about territorial integrity, spiritual and cultural uh, practices and traditions being restored, renewed and respected. When we take that on as deep regeneration, everything you just talked about, it's not just adaptation. It is, I think, the fundamental premise of resilience, spiritual resilience, cultural resilience, political resilience, and yes, agricultural resilience to future shocks, which are guaranteed given what we have done to the planet. 
So Sarah, you've, you've painted a really lovely picture of the integrated nature of all these various elements. Both of you have. I want to, Pavan, ask you a question that gets at, at this kind of integrated systemic view from a different angle. So I happen to sit on the Committee for World Food Security Advisory Committee. And right after the invasion in Ukraine, there was a special meeting and there was a presentation from the WTO, the FAO and the World Food Programme. During those three presentations, they raised a whole lot of really critical issues that we're confronting as a global community. The invasion of Ukraine, obviously, is one. A global health pandemic, obviously, is another one. <laughs> also, extreme weather events that we're all feeling, um, regardless of where we are on the planet. Some places worse than others, but I think we can all say we're all feeling that. And even, you know, getting into things like the breakdown of democracy, public debate, etc., I was struck in these presentations that A, the immediate solutions, the emergency solutions were solutions that reinforced the old system, right? It's like, oh my God, we just got to grow more wheat. We've got to keep with long global supply chains, you know, all this stuff that's really not as Sarah says fit for purpose anymore, but that's the emergency response. The other reflection from my perspective was how siloed we're thinking about all these crises, but they're actually all totally connected. So I'm wondering from your perspective, what needs to be done, especially at sort of these political levels where a lot of decisions are getting made about how countries adapt, respond, et cetera. So what needs to be done to really bring these things together? And are you seeing any good examples of countries, of different groups attending to this in a good and systemic way that is leading out, us out of the status quo and towards something that is much better. I think it, it uh, draws from the complex nature of the problems and challenges that we are facing, which Sarah so eloquently described just a moment ago, uh, uh, recognizing the different layers, the different layers of the challenge, that it, it is a geopolitical challenge, a social challenge, and a challenge of integration, a challenge of not just mitigation, but adaptation to climate risk, a challenge of equity across who has to be given the opportunity and ability to adapt and why and so on. And wrapping that into a, a, a new concept, regenerative farming, natural farming, as is known in, in my country, in India. It's, it's really uh, coming up to a point where we have no choice but to embrace complexity. And that's a plea, a request, and ask, call it what you want that I have. Please embrace complexity. You know, so many times as, as an advisor and analyst, I get people complaining about, oh, my well, STDs are so complicated. And I say, please, please, they have to be. We have created a complex set of problems. We have created a world in which we have set off like nine fuses, lighting nine time bombs. You may call them planetary boundaries. I call them planetary time bombs. And please don't expect a simple solution to that. You need to be comprehensive, holistic in your thinking and recognize that the solutions that come to you will be like that as well. Uh, so I think th the need to embrace the complexities of the Sustainable Development Goals, I mean, just take a small point, which is relevant for us. So most people think that, you know, SDG 2 is really all about food systems. And it's not. Yes, it's about hunger and, and about sustainable food and nutrition. But there's so much more. It's also about human health. It's also about water and its use and its, its rationing, which is SDG 6. So we've got SDG 2 and SDG 3 and SDG 6. And please remember that a, a large proportion of the areas which are food insecure have poor people living there. So it's also about poverty, which is SDG 1. And at the end of the day, if we pursue the direction of natural farming, regenerative farming, we will have secured soil biodiversity, which will feed insect biodiversity, which will generate bird life and other such biodiversity. We will, see, we will create crop biodiversity in the process of gen regenerating soil biodiversity. And therefore, it's all about life on land and life underwater as well. So it's SDG 14 and 15 as well thrown in. So tell me that this is only about one SDG. It is not. It cannot be. And this is how... People have to start thinking, and I'm sorry to say this, this is how ministers have to start thinking. So to say that I'm the Minister of Commerce and I shall do thus, and I'm the Minister of Food and I shall do thus, and, you know, I'm the Water Minister and this is my area, and, you know, I'm the Climate Minister within the Environment Ministry and I'm just doing... No, no, no. 
each of these have to talk to the other, the forest minister, the, the, the climate minister, the, the food department, the health department, and, and so on. So I think governments need to, to bring this agenda together and create. And you know what? To me, the SDGs to government should be the lifeline. It should be their excuse that, well, you know what? I'm so sorry, Mr. Health Minister, but you can't make a unilateral decision on this because actually the reason why you've got so many people suffering from kidney disease is because of you know, certain pesticides and fertilizers that are being misused or, or abused or whatever, uh, or used. And therefore, we need to speak with the food minister and the commerce minister because he's the one who recommends subsidies and the finance minister who decides how to set them. So we need to have a committee, which is an SDG committee on food systems, which takes into account all of these SDGs and therefore all of these ministries. And it can't be a unilateral. So this is going to be a very tough conversation. No minister wants to give up, give up power. Trust me, I've met a few in my life and I'm sure you have. Uh, and, but, and yet this is what they need to do is to give up individual power in preference for collective power. That's going to be a tough challenge, but it needs to be something we need to head on and ask for as citizens and as activists or as analysts, as, as whoever we may be. I would actually challenge that, wondering whether whether uh, this would mean giving up power. It's actually just using the power. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe using it differently. Yeah, maybe, well, you know what, you know how people think, people think they're giving it up, but actually yeah, it's about yeah, using exactly. your power more effectively, right? More effectively. What's exactly. the power yeah. worse yeah. if you don't use it in the yeah. right way, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so, but it's actually a really good segue to the next question. And um, that's for you, Sarah. The upcoming events are all promising in terms of what we're discussing here, but there's one that could be of particular importance. This September, the Biden-Harris administration is hosting the first White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. We hear that the conversation will center on how to end hunger and increase healthy eating and physical activity by 2030. And the goal is for few Americans to experience diet-related diseases like diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. So what policy changes would you like immediately love to see discussed, being discussed uh, at this conference with regard to what we discussed just now? Yes, the, the long awaited White House conference. We, we definitely have some asks that we're, we're putting on the table. But, you know, the context here is that although Americans have some of the most affordable food in the world, as we're discussing in this conversation, our food comes with hidden costs. It's to our health, the climate, farmers, fishers, ranchers, food workers. You know, our true cost accounting report in the US found that for the $1 trillion dollars in value, our food system is generating $3 trillion in health, environment, and equity costs. So we're at this 3x price tag that we need to really understand and address through policy. So our four kind of big policy asks that we're bringing to the White House, the first is around purchasing. You know, we think there is a lot of power in leveraging federal purchasing for food systems transformation. So what we're asking for is to see that government as a huge purchaser of food, right? Whether that's for hospitals, prisons, public uh, schools, and more, can it revise its purchasing standards to prioritize nutrition, environment, and the multiple dimensions we've been talking about in this conversation? And, you know, Concretely, what does that look like? It looks like whole grains rather than refined wheat, rice, and corn. And, and the reason this is powerful, not just because of the millions of children and adults that consume food that is procured by the federal government, because of also the signal it sends to industry, which then helps with this bigger quest of rewiring the food system. So that's one. A second ask, we really want to see integration of nutritious food into the healthcare system, right? And, and the way that can come about is through food as medicine intervention. So that contains a whole lot of asks, whether it's medically tailored meals, let's not give somebody in the hospital who just had a heart attack, a plate full of jello and fried chicken. Let's think about therapeutic foods, healthy foods that help restore their, their uh, thriving health. Uh, produce prescription programs. There's the Gus Schumacher uh, Nutrition Incentive Program. That's a, a program in the US that offers financial incentives for low-income consumers to buy fruits and vegetables at the point of purchase. In all of this, we know, as I've said in our discussion here, that diet-related diseases like diabetes or cardiovascular disease, they're burdening millions of people, but disproportionately 
they're burdening Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And yet this health system is not catering sufficiently to them, nor emphasizing uh, nutrition uh, dimensions nearly enough. We think policy can help. So the third ask, we want to strengthen federal nutrition programs, and that means supporting these efforts focused on food and nutrition security to improve healthy food access. And the last, and, and it's something, Pava, and you've, you've really pulled out here today, we need to understand how life below the soil sustains life above the soil. And that means restructuring agricultural support programs to drive regenerative farming founded on principles of equity and justice with a particular focus on Black and Indigenous farmers who've had their land stolen and who have been denied access to government agricultural services for generations. So, you know, zooming out, all of those policy changes need to be advanced simultaneously, and they all need to be predicated on these principles of equity and justice. So that's that's what we're coming in um, and putting on the table for the White House conference. And you're an optimist on the outcomes as well at this regard, Sarah? I hope so. I mean, we've everyone has observed globally the, the gridlock we've had in the United States getting policy action you know, under the Biden administration. So let's hope. We just had a major um, opening for climate legislation and funding just in the past two weeks. So there there is hope. Let's see what we get. I'd love to dig into this a little bit more, Sarah, because you've been such a strong voice on equity. Both of you have in this conversation, and I know in your work very, very much so. You really, both of you, speak very strongly about putting people at the center of food systems transformation, particularly Indigenous and communities of color, marginalized communities, farmers, and women. Sarah, you're just talking about the White House conference. You're talking about equity. Um, I saw a tweet from one of your tweets from this year's Stockholm Plus 50 meeting with the UN General Assembly. You pointed out that farmers weren't included in the conversation. And as you wrote in your tweet, how can we open the tent to other voices? So, Sarah, maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. How, how do we actually do that? How do we actually center these people, these communities within the debate particularly this political debate. So we're back to the first question around governance, right? How do we how do we set the table properly so that those voices are in the center of the conversation? Sarah? You've been such a, a luminary in helping institutions like the Rockefeller think about this through the Global Alliance and articulating the the really beautiful calls to action that you've laid out. So I wanna I wanna recognize that. And I think at the heart of the work you've been driving that we celebrate and and want to champion ourselves, the best way to open the tent is to build it from the beginning with the people it is meant to gather. That's how you open the tent, right? So the stopgap measures are insufficient. And for the Rockefeller Foundation, I mean, that really does mean fundamentally changing how we do our work, including how we make grants. And, and that's a big ask of philanthropy. And it's an ask that we're hearing. And I'll give an example of how it can look, which, which was a program that was unlike anything Rockefeller had ever done before, which is this food system vision prize. I think we recognized that we really don't have as, as foundation, we don't have complete knowledge as to what people want. What, what does an equitable, nourishing, regenerative system mean in Northern India? What does it mean in Lima, Peru? What does it mean on an Indian reservation in South Dakota? We don't know. We, and we should, it's very dangerous to suggest that we do. So we created this, this mechanism called the Food System Vision Prize. And this idea was to invite anyone anywhere to put it down on paper and not to just articulate this as an individual, to do so as a community. So what is a community's vision for the transformation across technology, policy, environment, economics, culture, and diet? What is it What does it look like if we get it right? Not a kind of implausible utopia, but a feasible, transformational, and inspirational vision for tomorrow. And I'll be honest, like when we crafted this, we were maybe um, a little afraid that not too many people would take the bait because this is this is hard stuff. I mean, Pavan, you you made such great points that I was silently snapping for um, about how people. 
I think really loathe complexity and because, because it's, it's overwhelming. Right. And so asking people to articulate this kind of vision is, is a bit of torture. We were overwhelmed with the response for thousand organizations across 119 countries, 1,300 teams, indigenous, rural, corporate, government, you know, putting forward their visions. And then Rockefeller putting $2 million of prize money. But I think more interestingly, creating a totally novel accelerator with a BIPOC led group of artists and storytellers on visioning and communication and movement building. And now, now that those, um, the 1300 became 76, became 10. Now that we have our top 10 visionaries, we're working with a documentary film crew to create a feature documentary to show the world in their voice, you know, what, what does it look like and how can we rally around these incredible movement builders who are among us. And I think, you know, in, in all of this work, and I know this is true for us each as individuals, there are days that this work is really heavy. You know, we're like saturated data that is really scary. I have a three-year-old son and I am very afraid of what he is going to confront when he is 20, 25, 30. We need hope, which means we need visions, which means if, you know, to the question again about the tent, we need to work relentlessly to hear the voices of those that we have very little proximity to. And this idea of those who are closest to the pain need to be closest to the power. And that means interrogating our own institutions as to, you know, coming back to my magic button, the redistribution of power. So there's a lot to that question and that tweet, Ruth, but I really appreciate the, the question. I want to turn to Pavan in a second, but first, Sarah, really quickly, number one for our listeners who may not be based in North America, what does BIPOC mean? Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Thank you for that, Ruth. Thank you. And secondly, um, before the documentary is out, is there somewhere where people can go and find the visions? Yes, absolutely. So we have them all linked on the Rockefeller website. So if you just type in food system vision prize, you'll find links to websites for each of those and a food series um, link that I can I can share in the chat with you, Ruth, where you can see 10 little mini documentaries already up on each of the 10 as well. Great. Thank you. So Pavan, we've known each other for a long time and we've been through the trenches on um, various projects, including Teabag for Food. And I have always so respected and appreciated what a strong voice you are for equity and food systems. And I'm just wondering if you can explain to us here on the call and to our listeners, why are you such a strong advocate for equity? Let me begin by appreciating your, yourself and Sarah for picking up this whole issue of bringing diversity into the discourse today. Uh, too little have we heard, Sarah, as you're painfully aware as I am, uh, the voices that we need to hear of the poor farmer uh, or of the, the women farmers who are literally a large part of the farm workforce in sub-Saharan Africa and in the Indian subcontinents. Too little do we hear their voices. You know, uh, one tends to there's a degree of tokenism in the way that one reflects diversity. But I keep reminding uh, all kinds of people that, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion is nothing unless you achieve the other two, which means you need to provide not just a representation of different color and, and different origin or different kind of person, such as a poor person or a poor farmer uh, in whatever group you are convening, but actually to do the sort of thing that you just described, Sarah, which is to give them voice and to give them input into decision-making and selection and choices. That's what is the voice and the choice that actually leads to inclusion. And without the inclusion, the diversity is merely a foundation. I mean, it's, it's a necessary but completely insufficient thing for you to achieve inclusion. So getting that inclusion in place means listening to the women. And, and I'll tell you a beautiful story, true story, which you would hear from uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar, who's an ex-retired civil servant, the chief of Secretary of the State of Andhra Pradesh, which I, which I briefly mentioned. The entire farming movement, the natural farming movement in Andhra Pradesh began with him going to the women's communities, basically the, the same self-help groups that had been created by him and his, his government colleagues for uh, microfinance, women's self-help groups, asking them, sisters, 
there is one unfinished job which I didn't do as a, as a civil servant, which was to give you better farming. Will you help me? And they all, to a voice, to a woman, said yes. That entire group has now become the hardcore, the, the sort of the, the, the framework of the organization, which is the Natural Farming Organization, RYSS, in Andhra Pradesh. If you Google APCNF, stands for Andhra Pradesh Community Natural Farming, APCNF.com, you'll find a lot more about them. But that's an amazing movement. It's now 8,000 of these mainly women master farmers who are going from village to village teaching techniques which are, of course, all geographically different, right? Because as you go from highland areas to lowland areas to rain-fed areas to, to irrigated areas, you, different things work in different places. There's an actual movement, and we have more than 750,000 750, farmers in that state committed to, to natural farming or have already converted to natural farming, thanks to this network movement driven by women. That's representation. That's inclusion. That's voice. That's power. You referred to power, Sarah? Absolutely right. This is about handing power in the hands of women. Fantastic. I'm not a photographer, but the photograph of which I'm the most proud is a photograph I took of a young lady who was speaking to us panel. Remember, Ruth, you were on that panel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I took a photograph of her while she was speaking to us about her experience. She was a poor uh, scheduled caste, which means the lowest caste category in India, landless laborer when she decided to take a plunge go to her women's self-help group and take a loan of just 100,000 rupees. That's like $1,200. Take a loan to set up her own natural farming farm on one acre of land and gradually did so well that she became a master farmer. I mean, that to me is my most inspiring story that I've ever come across. And uh, I'm, I was privileged to meet her a second time because I had tweeted this out and she recognized me and says, yeah, you send that photograph of me out. And I met her again. <laughs> of all the people in a, in a huge state of 55 million people. But, you know, this is the kind of story that you, that you hear and you see and you experience when you engage in this. And I'm so privileged that I was part of one of them. Amazing. These are the stories that we need to hear. And I'm pretty uh, optimistic that our listeners also will love those stories. So we've actually come to uh, conclude this call and I was um, asked to uh, summarize. I won't. Um, it's impossible. It was such an excellent conversation. I would not give justice with my summary to it. So we uh, sincerely ask our listeners to listen in again if they want to catch up at certain points because it was really good. One thing that I may repeat though are the two buttons that we started this conversation with. I think they make total sense in terms of um, not just watching and not just following the GDP economy, but um, the true cost accounting and making true cost accounting for the economy is mandatory, which was your point, Pavan. And then the second button, the redistribution of power. So we've established those two buttons, so they exist. So we now <laughs> just need to call. find those who press that um, button. And I particularly also like uh, to highlight again this point of, you know, learning from where it has worked and um, learning from inspirational story where true cost accounting, regenerate agriculture um, actually have worked and have proved that uh, it actually can be a very inspirational story and a world that you would really like to live up to. So I think that's also really an important point. And there were many other points that you raised that we would need it to update our operational system, let me put it this way. And I guess uh, we will see this operational system being updated soon. So from my end, Many thanks again, Pavan and um, Sarah, for joining us in this call. I'd like to invite our listeners to continue the conversation via Twitter or LinkedIn uh, or online. And of course, feel free to check our websites. Well, just again, Sarah Pavan, thank you so much for a fantastic discussion. Uh, for our listeners, would love to hear what your main takeaways are. And yes, you can you can find Foundations 20 at F20 platform. You can find the Global Alliance for the Future of Food at Future of Food Org. Once again, I'm Ruth Richardson. And I'm Stefan Zurich. Thanks so much for joining us.